Good evening, I'm Peter Sharoshi and you are watching Drag Reporter Cafe. Today we will speak about unhappy birthdays. They are unhappy because these birthdays are the birthdays of drug laws that caused immense suffering to people, at least according to their civil society critics who launched campaigns to remark the anniversaries of the adoption of these laws in Belgium, where the drug law is 100 years old, and in the UK, where the Misuse of Drugs Act is 50 years old. So I'm happy to introduce our guest today, uh, uh, Esther Kintsova from uh, Transform UK, who is a research and policy officer. Hi, Esther. Hi. And uh, Stéphane Leclerc from Fedito Bruxelles, which is a federation of uh, drugs issues in, in Belgium. Hi, Stéphane. Hello. So let's start talk about uh, the law in the UK and your campaign. So why have you launched this 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 campaign? What is what is the main message of your campaign? Um, yeah. So like you said, the campaign is marking the 50th anniversary of the Misuse of Drugs Act, uh, which is one of the key pieces of legislation for drug re regulation in the UK. And we're running the campaign in collaboration with uh, three other organisations: Drug Science Release and UK Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Our key message is that essentially the Misuse of Drugs Act is not fit for purpose and not only that but it was never really fit for purpose um, since it was given royal assent on the 27th of May in 1971. It was it has just caused unimaginable amounts of harms or has whilst it has been an act harms have been seen um, and it has remained largely unchanged since 1971. It's failed on one of its key purposes, which is to reduce drug consumption. And instead, while it has been in place, it's increased, uh, dam increasingly damaged public health and exacerbated social inequalities. Uh, we've had 50 years of this damning legislation and ultimately we can't afford to have 50 more. So that's why we've launched this campaign now. What about Belgium, uh, Stefan? Can you talk about your campaign a bit? Yes, the, it's a special year. It's difficult to put these topics uh, on the agenda uh, and we want to try to have this law uh, uh, removed and, and changed. And, and, and so we, 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 are, we launched the campaign in February, which was really the day of, of the law. That is from 1921. Eh? So it's really another time. Um, no phone, women could not vote. I mean, it was another world. This, this law has been modified a little bit, but the base is still the same. And, and so uh, we will be campaigning all year long to try to put this topic on the agenda in the parliament, for the government, in the Senate, and try to have somewhere um, something uh, that could start a real debate on analyzing uh, what has been the impact of this law. And, and, and we want a new one to be based on science and, and at least we would like also to have the decriminalization of uh, drug users. And, and yeah, we have started with uh, this uh, title, Unhappy Birthday, and we are produ producing a lot of, of messages for the politicians, but also about, uh, for the, the general public, um, about also the stigmatization of, of drug users to change the vision people have on, on on drug user and drug policies, and, and we will see how it goes. Thanks. So let's suppose I'm uh, like a skeptic man on the street uh, who, who, who would like to ask you, like, what, what evidence do you have that, that these drug laws don't work and they have harms? But that's, that's a question to both of you. Um, I'll, I'll go first. So I think if you look at the data, we can see that um, since the time the act that has been in place, it's had little to no effect on the legal drug market, which is now estimated to be worth around £9 billion in the UK. And to add to that, the total cost to society of illegal drugs is estimated to be about £20 billion. Um, and in fact, the government's own recent independent review on drugs, which was commissioned by a former Home Secretary, found that the government interventions to restrict supply have had limited success and have noted the resilience of the market makes it doubtful that more funding or police intervention would have any significant effect, showing that the main premise of a misuse of drugs act to interrupt supply is not working. 
Um, and in fact, it further is acknowledged that enforcement activity has sometimes had unintended consequences, including increasing levels of drug related violence in the market and um, also negative effects of involving individuals in the criminal justice system. And that's only the conclusion of one phase of a report of an independent review. And we have had many that have over the years and over the decades been showing that this is not working and we need reform and have been largely ignored. Tragically, we have hit another record year for drug related deaths in the UK and been steadily increasing over time. We are now 4, 000, around 4,300 drug related deaths in, recorded in 2019. And Scotland has declared a public health emergency. Um, to add to that, more people, more than a third of people in prison are there due to crimes relating to drug use, and a significant proportion of stops and searches by police are under the Misuse of Drugs Act, um, which is just demonstrating that criminal justice approach, despite have really ramping up, has never actually shown any effective results. Um, as I said, yeah, that over the past 50 years there have been numerous reports. And most recently, the government's health and social care committees, as well as the so Scottish Affairs Committee, have both called for decriminalisation for, per uh, for personal use of drugs and for the introduction of drug consumption rooms, which the government has um, rejected. And this pattern we have actually demonstrated in a resource that we have created online, which is our timeline um, in which we aim to document the UK drug policy since 1971. In detail, it looks at, it, well, it aims to try and capture the key moments of drug policy by incorporating drug-related deaths, drug use data, prosecutions, stop and search, drug seizures, and so on, um, to demonstrate what the reality was happening under the current drug laws, and to really focus on both like the political and socio-cultural changes over time. So I would actually ultimately say, go and look at that timeline um, because I think it paints a picture of how over the years, the misuse of drugs that really has been failing in the UK. Yes, it's, um, when designing a campaign, it's, it's not easy. Eh? Like how, how can we, from which point of view, what do we save to, to which public? It's, it's not easy because uh, there's, it's linked to so many things. Uh, the drug policies are linked with so many things. And so I guess uh, on one side, we want to try to bring these, these facts uh, and try to have uh, different sectors uh, connected to the drug sector, different politicians, different politic, uh, political groups to at least recognize some facts, agree on the, the, the base, the facts of what's happening, what are the results of, of the investment that have been done so far in, in terms of uh, um, <clears throat> uh, policing and, 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 well, the drug policy we have now. We can compare what's invested in, in security, in health, in, and within health, what is for prevention and risk reduction and what is for treatment, and, and try to, to be open about all this. And so with, with our campaigning, we, we are really trying to, to, to to make this clear and simple and, and, and tackle economic issues, security issues, uh, human health issues, social justice and, and public health. And, and, and this is something we are trying to bring to the general public because it's not easy to have people that are not interested in drug issues to get interested in this because most people think, oh, this is not related to me. Uh, this is for people that are using drugs. And, and so this is difficult to, 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 to speak outside of our own bubble, eh? we, the European networks and people working with drug issues. So we try to produce some, some short video clips, two minutes clips from different types of people, professionals, some well-known writers, but also a doctor, um, police officer that is, he is working in an anti-drug squad and he finds his job useless. And so it's interesting to see these people that bring not uh, the type of uh, uh, discourse we are used to, to hear and make it clear and simple for people that don't know about these issues. And um, at the moment, we see that it can be also interesting in, the, in, in, in link with COVID 
uh, issues uh, in the world right now. We hear a lot, we have to base our decision on science. This is something that we are hearing uh, a lot of, of the time. And we want to say this about drugs too. And so it's difficult for them to say no. And so this is one of the main things I think we are pushing no. And, 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 and it's, it's, you, you cannot say no to that. And this seems to be quite, quite interesting to... It's, this year is different than other years, to say this. I think that's a really good point because it's exactly what we've identified is that everything, the whole rhetoric currently has been, we need evidence-based policy solutions. And what we've seen in drug policy is that actually that hasn't been happening necessarily. And you can't have this juxtaposition between the two. So I think it's a really powerful moment to say, well, if it is being promoted so much by governments at the moment, then why are they not doing it in other areas? Um, and actually also um, off the back of what Stefan has said, we are also producing um, short videos. Uh, we'll be launching 50 stories uh, on the 50th anniversary, which is the 27th of May, um, which will also be showcasing how people have been affected by the current drug laws, both personally and professionally, and why, why they think they need to be changed, um, which I think demonstrates, I guess we've both, and we know this, to be true is just you need the stories of people who are actually experiencing this they're really powerful to a campaign movement and so i guess that's why we've both decided to use those in ours as a key message we want also to, to launch uh, collaboration with institutions that are more recognized from the general public than ourselves so like uh, um, doctors of the world and on english médecins du monde this type of organization or Amnesty International. So we would like also to have collaborations with also even um, health insurance uh, to bring uh, on uh, the question of, of the difficulty here in Belgium to have uh, take home uh, naloxone, for example, it doesn't exist in Belgium. So we want also to, to, to go and work on really concrete topics that we cannot put um, on the table right now ourselves and have big institution join us and, and promote also our company. You know, there is a lot of talks now in the US about the war on drugs and how we should end the war on drugs. But for example, in Europe, what we have, it is not uh, perceived as a war on drugs and we don't have the same level of, uh, of mass incarceration. And we, we, we don't even talk much about the uh, racial side of, of, of drug policies here. So. But um, but but I, I suppose that it, it it also exists, although we, even even if we don't talk about it. So I suppose that in your countries uh, there is like lots of incarcerations caused by the repressive drug laws, and also I suppose that uh, the drug laws disproportionately affect ethnic minorities and and migrants. So is is that is that the case? Do I see it well, or that that this is similar in the U.S. and Europe? There is not so much difference. In Belgium, half of the people in jail it's related with drugs uh, or connected with drugs issues. It's half of the people in jail. So that's something we know. It could be done much better. I know that that's I will not go into this. And in terms of um, Profiling and the impact on of the drug law towards a certain public or neighborhoods. Uh, we don't have, I don't have at least so clear uh, the facts so clear like that. But yes, we, we see that the uh, yes drug use it's in all uh, parts of the population. Uh, uh, not all the same for the age, but uh, all 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 uh, socioeconomical profile use drugs. And then the people that do get a, a fine or a problem, it's not then the same. Uh, it's not the same proportion. So there is an impact that is uh, on the most vulnerable uh, part of the population for sure. Yes, and this is also one of the reason and one of the message we want to you know, work on. And also, it contrasts with the official police uh, discourse, discourse, which is we focus on traffic and and we we focus on that but then when we see the numbers for example in belgium uh, in 2018 there were more than 35000 
um, registered, uh, I don't know the, the, how to say this correctly in English, but registered facts related with drugs, just for cannabis, 35,000. This is a lot of just drug users, not traffickers. And these people, well, they are from some uh, neighborhoods more, more than other. So it, it does still has a big impact, even on just cannabis users. Esther? Um, yes, similarly, um, more than a third of people in prison are there due to crimes relating to drug use, um, which is frequently inquisitive crime to fund drug use. And so that is clearly, it is a problem despite perhaps maybe in conversation, it's not as overt as in America, it is an issue. Um, similarly, we have often heard around, like discussing around the world with drug issues that the US is experiencing a drug related death crisis, but actually with the most recent figures, certainly it would seem that we need to talk more about Europe with Scotland um, looking like the d drug death capital of the world at the moment, and that's highly concerning. Um, and to add to that, with on the racial profiling element, we have, um, I think we need to do more, uh, we need to do more to, do, to discuss that issue, but it has come out recently um, that black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people. A disproportionate amount of stop and searches are under the Misuse of Drugs Act for the reason of drug possession. Um, so that clearly is, we definitely do have a problem with that and it is actually coming more to the forefront now. The video you are watching now is produced by the Rights Reporter Foundation, a non-profit organization which is not supported by any governments or political parties. If you like this show, please support our work on our website, dragreporter.net. Make a donation today and become our supporting member. It makes a difference. Thank you. You told us why we have to reform drug use, but uh, do you also have proposals on how would you reform drug laws? Do you have uh, any concrete models of decriminalization with which you would follow? Because there are different ways how you can reform your drug laws. Well, first, if we could get an agreement with everyone in Belgium that what we have isn't working, that would be great. If people would have more courage to just and just take act, not not um, I mean act that this first step would be really already wonderful. And, and and then of course we would ask them then okay let's sit and decide what else we could try even for a few years try something new different. Um, and, and on, on these new propositions, um, we don't have just here one perfect proposition, let's do this. And within the people that are joining us in this campaign to change the law, there are people that agree on that it's not working, but we don't all agree between us on what should be done. But that's fine. Uh, we want to do this with others. We want to discuss this. And um, in Belgium at the moment, there is an agreement uh, between uh, the, the, the three big federations that are regroup, regrouping all the main um, professional centers working with drug issues. So all the treatment centers, all the people doing prevention, that's in Belgium around 170 or 180 um, uh, institutions working with drugs, the main ones. And right now, we have an agreement that we all want to push for decriminalization of drug users. So this is uh, a first level. This is the minimum we would, we would want, and we all agree on that. So that's already something. And so I am not speaking about small activist groups. I am talking, this is the federations working on drug issues in Belgium. So this is something quite interesting. So it's so interesting that a federation like mine join this type of campaign because usually this doesn't come from this type of this type of institution uh, it comes more from smaller activist groups so here my federation is 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 joining this campaign which is really nice and in my federation we also did and we had a work group that worked during one year and a half 
to prepare a model for decriminalizing and, and, reglement and uh, regulating cannabis in Belgium. Now, this is only my federation in Brussels. The other ones are not on this uh, proposition, but for cannabis, we, we define a full model, for example, of what could be happening in Belgium uh, from producing, uh, distributing, and, and controlling the whole secret of, uh, in terms of uh, regulating cannabis. And we have a special focus if we, we, we propose a model from, for Belgium that would be um, a mix between different options that could live together, that would combine autoculture of cannabis, but also um, cannabis social clubs. So the non-profit sector would have a big part in, in managing the, the cannabis issues. And on the side, also the therapeutic uh, medical cannabis uh, uh, part of the circuit related with uh, pharmacies and an, another type of um, management system. And if there is a commercial model, it would have to be really, really well regulated by the state in order not to repeat the mistakes that were uh, done with uh, uh, alcohol or, or tobacco and, and the role that these big industries played in, in, in this. I'm kind of at risk of uh, echoing Stefan in a lot of these things because I think we're probably experiencing a very parallel idea of how this campaign is going because we're very much also at the beginning of just needing consensus that the current drug laws are not working that is where we're starting from and we want that to be cross-party and we need um we need parliamentarians but the public alike to realize that it touches everyone that drug policy needs to change uh so we're currently aiming to get um as many parliamentarians as possible to sign up to a statement that calls for uh, a review, uh, oh no, reform and new legislation instead of the misuse, current Misuse of Drugs Act and take a public health approach rather than a criminal justice approach. Um, so we really hope that we can just garner as much support as we can from that. I think there is a, a sort of atmosphere, perhaps a fear of politicians speaking out um, for drug policy reform in the UK. And we really want to create an environment in which they feel like they can have the confidence to speak out about it. We do have lots of existing politicians who already are very good, strong advocates on drug policy reform, and we want to be able to add to that group and make sure that there is uh, a public conversation around it. It isn't just silent reformers. Um, to add to that, therefore, yes, the, the ultimate principle is that we want the reform, we want acknowledgement of reform, and we want to call for new legislation and we need to start there. Um, in terms of alternative drug laws, Transform believes that we should move to legal regulation of all drugs, as we've previously set out in a lot of our literature, uh, essentially establishing a um, risk-based licensing system for drugs. So that is, that's our core uh, aim for uh, drug policy reform. But however, within this campaign, we just want to get consensus on reform itself and see where we can go from there but um to add to that there is actually a private members bill in parliament at the moment which has been put forward by an mp which is um proposing a review of the misuse of drugs act and we really welcome this bill and hope that it succeeds and hope that we can garner as much support for it within parliament as we can um, because it really is definitely a step in the right direction and it's good that there is something now on paper happening in the house of commons so in the end this is a polit it will be a political decision to reform drug laws so uh can you describe uh, us the, the political situation around drug laws right now in your countries? Like who is against, who is supporting reform? Is there really a strong support among the political parties uh, or the government uh, of, of these issues? <laughs> so the political situation is quite complex in Belgium with our different regions and languages and many political groups. Um, there are groups that already proposed also some interesting bills, uh, uh, but that didn't really um, made it to the to be really debated in the parliament in the end. 
Uh, this will have to be done at the federal level. Um, and there are differences between the political groups. Some are more progressist. Some don't really care much about this issue. It's not, a, it's not a, in their priority. And it's, we don't really know. They don't really have a clear position. And some other party could really be the classical uh, zero tolerance hard uh, position that you can see uh, where they're related with uh, uh, extreme right kind of uh, political strategies. So we have a bit of everything and we have a lot of parties. So it's not like we have to convince one or two big parties. We have to convince a lot of parties and and it's not easy because it's not on their priorities either. So it's it's, it's really not easy. What about UK? Um, yes, so we have a majority conservative government which is taking a zero tolerance hardline criminal justice approach to drug policy. Um, we in even just trying to set up drug consumption rooms um, has been difficult against the UK government that they've been quite reticent to uh, support any sort of change. And as I previously said, they rejected two recommendations from separate committees to set up drug consumption rooms and also to look into decriminalization for, uh, personal possession um so that is sort of it's very it's a difficult environment to be working in and it would be um naive to not not be aware of that um on the other hand there are some there are some good politicians in other parties who are definitely reformed uh, aiming for reform and actually two parties have um, legal regulation in their manifestos so there is there is some hope in that but I think we are yes we are we are an interesting situation um, I mean very recently the leader of the opposition the Labour Party Keir Starmer described our current drug policies as roughly right which is obviously a concern and it is very disappointing for us to hear that um however he did end that with saying that we need to be having a discussion um so we are we're really hoping that that means that that is just fear of or lack of confidence for speaking out about drug policy reform in the public i think um many politicians are tied by the media to how they present um so Yes, it's we're really at the bottom, but we're really trying to like get Ghana support from the bottom up and try and get there, but there, there are obstacles certainly. On the other hand, we do have a lot of work that's happening in Scotland. Um, so that's very interesting. And I think that the issues in Scotland will possibly tip over the edge the um, idea of opening up drug consumption rooms. So that will be that's something to watch in the UK at the moment. Okay, so before we conclude our conversation here, uh, can you also share us some some lessons learned uh, about your campaigns, which which maybe other organizations in other countries can, you know, benefit? Like uh, uh, like what did you learn about what works in in mass communication? What arguments work? What arguments did not work? Or what tools worked in communication? So. Something like something like you know that those lessons. Let's start now with Esther. Um, I think we're very much at the beginning of this campaign, um, as we're planning to run it for right up to its full fiftieth year next May. So, it will probably be easier to come back to me in a year's time to be able to properly reflect on how things are going. Um, I think one of the issues is obviously that this is currently in. A campaign entirely based online due to COVID restrictions so we're having to be really creative about how we get our messages across um, and then second to that due to COVID we're trying to um, establish contact and communication within parliament with um, MPs that are totally overwhelmed by COVID issues uh, so it's sort of kind of trying to get through the barrier of emails that they are uh, receiving at all times. Um, however, we've had some very interesting things that we've thought about that and we are we have got an event in Parliament virtually 
happening in May. So I think that will be quite a good um, alternative to what would have usually been an in-person lobby that we organised throughout Anyone's Child campaign. Um, the other thing I think that has been really powerful is, and Stefan um, re um, referred to this earlier as well, is pointing to how different things were back then. And certainly we don't have 100 years, but 50 years is still substantial enough. And so we've been putting out some graphics to really uh, simply uh, present how much things have changed in the last 50 years and how outdated and outmoded the Misuse of Drugs Act is in relation to that. So, uh, for example, we've been we've done a sort of mix of light-hearted graphics, such as pointing out what a phone looked like in 1971, but also wanted to strike a more serious tone around how so our attitudes in society and, and towards health have really changed since 1971. So um, we've used the example, for, uh, for example, the ability to fire women from their workplace for being pregnant was was legal in 1971 was the same year that our drugs laws were created it's just there's a sort of mis disconnect between where we were and how we still here with some things and have really progressed in others um so i'm not sure if that's really answered the question but <laughs> we, we 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 hope that it will be effective as we go along i guess for us it was really important to use this momentum it was 100 years uh, since 1921 so we did get some media attention because there there was an anniversary so this helped to to try to have this topic in places where it isn't usually so th this has worked because the week of the the anniversary anniversary we really had interviews and we had we were present in all the media radio press and also a little bit on tv so that worked that was nice um, what was also really nice is that the way the media uh, covered the topic was quite good, um, which is not so easy to say because maybe 10 years ago we would have had a big opposition and stupid headlines ridiculizing the topic. This has happened a lot in the past and we have not had that. Um, so that was good. We People, the, the journalists were really... Uh, asking interesting questions, the debates were interesting, and and were not just polarized. So it it was this was quite a good surprise. Um, but then uh, the, the real impact so we we don't know. We don't know yet. We will see if really somewhere there can be a a, a working group uh, at the state level or somewhere else where this question will be uh, discussed uh, openly. And, and this is too soon to say, maybe in the end of the year, I can tell you more about that. Um, and then on really communication, uh, on our communication strategies, we really try to, to, to group different types of messages, messages that are uh, against stereotypes, messages to remind uh, uh, some of the facts. And we try to, to have references for all, all the things we say to have scientific references. Uh, so it's on the didactical level, we, we have uh, small slogans. So we compare drug use with uh, um, mountaining, uh, uh, I don't know how you say this, going to the mountain or car driving. So simple things to, to, to help people um, get to the, the heart of the issue, but then being really serious about what we are saying. So I hope next time we will, when we will discuss uh, about these things, we 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 won't uh, speak about anniversaries, but because we we won't have uh, this obsolete and outdated drug laws, but we will uh, speak about uh, uh, the how how decriminalization went in your countries. Uh, Esther, Stefan, thank you so much for, for being with us today. Thank you. thank you for having me. And thank you so much for those who are watching us on, on Facebook. Please uh, stay with us on social media. And remember, uh, Drug Reporter Cafe is uh, operated or run by a, a non-profit organization. So please make a donation today if you like this video show and if you would like that to be continued. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.